Hello. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bram Wasi, and I stand proudly in support of today's resolution. But this House believes that nations of the world should increase protection of the economic and social rights of migrants. First, we'd like to offer a couple of definitions. We define a migrant as anyone who moves to another country to seek work. We define economic rights as the concern of production, development, and management of materials. And social rights are the protection of basic communal freedoms such as speech, life, and liberty. In Malaysia, only a multi-million dollar lawsuit in February of this year exposed the atrocities of employers that left migrants without con contracts and the constant fear of deportation. Saudi Arabia and Kuwait were both subjects to the 2010 Human Rights Watch investigation, which found that migrants were at risk because of immigration sponsorship systems put the migrants um, in statuses in their employers' hands. In Boston in 2007, a police raid of a leather factory revealed that workers were forced to pay $20 fines for talking or using the bathroom for more than two minutes. Migrants and their children continue to have limited to no access to education, further crippling their ability to prosper. Without an increase of rights and protection for migrants, such deplorable conditions will only continue. The affirmative advocates a plan to increase the socioeconomic rights of migrants, providing access to education for children of the migrants, and creating an application process for regulating the labor force to stop the discrimination involved, including the exploitation of workers, and it will eventually boost the economies of all of the countries involved in the plan. These workers should have the humane conditions and a chance to become documented migrants. The New York Times reported an example of success in the Dominican Republic in 2010, where successful labor regulation of migrant, uh, migrant labor, even in cheap factories, occurred in the Alta Gracia factories in the Dominican Republic that were pressured to regulate the workers' rights while paying a living wage and has remained a successful business even today. Our first argument is that migrants that help their host countries deserve to have their rights protected, and helping us, them also helps us in two ways. First, migrants boost a country's economy and GDP. Providing them with socioeconomic rights gives them the recognition they deserve as well as the tools to further improve society. In many cases, migrants are a crucial part of a nation's economy's success. In the UK, care workers for the elderly are primarily comprised of migrant workers who have become increasingly important due to an aging population. Despite these workers' contributions, a COMPS report on the role of migrant care workers in the UK states that, quote, discrimination against migrant workers in relation to working conditions and the incidence of verbal abuse emerges as a key issue that must be addressed, end quote. No matter how hard a government tries to stem the tide of immigrants, there will always be people who wish to cross the border into a new country in search of, crop, in search of new opportunities. For example, attempts by the United States to curb immigration from Mexico have failed to meaningfully decrease the number of immigrants. The focus of policies should therefore be on how to regulate immigration so that it benefits all parties involved, rather than how to ignore the problem. Undocumented workers alone in the United States provide $1.8 trillion in annual spending and $650 billion in the annual output. Educating these workers gives them the treatment that they deserve. The second way migrants help their host country is by providing healthy competition. Without socioeconomic rights and regulation, migrants often end up doing work for much lower wages. In a world where migrants lack fundamental rights, they are easily exploited in the labor force by the natives. When employers know that for every non-migrant worker out there, there will always be a migrant worker who they can pay less, they won't hire the natives or the non-migrant workers. However, affirming the resolution allows for the creation of a system of fundamental economic rights that enables workers to join a formal economic system to fight for better wages and give them bargaining power. This ultimately opens up competition for the jobs and puts everyone on an equal playing field, solving the problem of unfair job competition. Our second argument is that in addition to the benefits we just mentioned, increased migration helps the migrants' country's origin economically in two ways as well. First, the economists estimated that a freer migration resulting in more equal wages and increased rights across 179 countries could more than double the GDP. The change would add between 5 trillion and 16 trillion to a global income of about 8 trillion. The second way increased rights for migrants might improve conditions is by sending money home to the country of origin, economically through, money, uh, economically through a process called remittances. In 2008, in uh, 2009, I apologize, there were an estimated $414 billion sent home to migrants' countries of origin from the U.S. alone, a substantial increase even with the current economic climate. Rich countries are the main source of these remittances. The United States is by far the largest, with USD of about $46 billion in recorded outward flows in 2008. Quote, remittances are a vital source of financial report that directly increase the income of migrants' families. Remittances lead to in health, in health investments, education, and small businesses. With better tracking of migration remittance trends, policy 
make important decisions, end quote. Says Hans Timmer, director of the development prospects at the World Bank. Similarly, Dalit Ratha, manager of the migration remittance unit at the World Bank, says the remittances in 2008 and 2009 became even more of a lifeline to poor countries, given the massive decline in private capital flows sparked by the crisis. However, high unemployment is prompting many migrants to receive countries to tighten immigration quotas, which would probably actually slow the growth of these remittances. Thus, because we believe that, important work, uh, that these important workers deserve basic socioeconomic rights, we affirm today's resolution. Thank you for your time. trying to increase this protection exactly by that. Okay, so the resolution says that we should try to increase the socioeconomic rights of these migrants. So what we're saying is that in a world where these rights are increased, it's going to be better off than a world where these rights are not increased. The actual policies may be dependent on the country's legislation. And how, but we're how exactly that. are you willing to do that if they already have those rights? Well, what we're saying is they don't have those rights. And we mentioned in oh, our so you're telling us that you want to give them more rights. Okay, so you might come up here and give a ton of examples about how some countries have all these laws, but that's not all countries. What we're advocating is all countries, regardless, should increase these rights, which will mean the countries that don't have the rights are the ones benefiting. As long as there's any benefit, that's clearly a reason to affirm, and we you, give you the reasons as to why. You talked problem. us about undocumented migrants. Are you referring to illegal migrants? Yeah. So basically, you want to increase the rights of those who went illegally into a country, right? Well, we, what we're saying is that they should be afforded certain humane rights. The, you know, the humane well, rights so that they the should be afforded are rights for which uh, each, each person can benefit, right? Well, these human rights, as we've shown, are not necessarily always going to be upheld in all countries, but we, the reason we are trying to uphold these rights is because the, migrant, the illegal immigrants, even in like the U.S., which is trying to stop them from coming in, are going to keep coming in. And, and we have to at least try to resolve that problem in a different way by making it easier for them to become you legal. You want to give more rights to them, yet at the same time, don't they the have right these rights? Them is to no, not please answer the question. So, yeah. So you don't they already have these rights that well, you're no, talking about? They don't have rights. the right. They don't have the right to apply for legal migration. That's the right we're giving them. We're making it easier to regulate these people because they don't have the ability to go through legally. Similarly, even if they are illegal, they're still providing benefits for these countries. We give you statistics showing that they have annual outputs and inputs that are far greater. So than are you telling me that illegal migration? Actually, illegal migrants pay taxes to the economy in condition. In when you economy? buy something, you are paying a tax. You may not pay income tax, but a lot of the things you do, like if you make money and you go out and spend that money, that's all taxes. If you get a letter from someone from a different country, sure. there are tariffs involved. So Amongst taxes. all those examples that you gave us, how many illegal migrants are in the USA? Uh, about 700 million. And how do we know this number? Uh, not 700 million, 700,000. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly how many are there? Uh, well, basic polls and like just studies of so the actual basically time people go from house to house. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, they people, don't, they don't wait, wait, them. let me uh, finish the question. Yeah. People go from house to house, ask people who is an illegal migrant, and people actually admit to that. Okay. So a lot of the, the actual statistics are probably going to be based on like projections, right? So they see people are coming over, they can't find the people once they come over. So like they see them coming over and they make projections based on the turn of time or something like that. If you'd like to criticize the actual like study itself, my partner can bring it up in like the next speech. So do you want the remittances to be the only source of income that countries, developing countries have? No, we're not saying that at all. We're saying that remittances can provide the basis for an increased economy in these other countries. Thank you.
So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to prove to you that even at principal level, their case does not stand, and then I'm going to tell you that we want to see how it would work at practical level if it would pass. And then I'm going to bring forward the opposition case, which will say that this, uh, this policy is not necessary, and the fact that it also brings negative aspects. First of all, the, all, all the examples that the first speaker brought at the beginning, yeah, they're true, so let's move forward. The fact is that we are talking about all countries as he admitted in the cross-examinations, and they don't show to us how exactly is it possible for all countries to accept it. So even at recipient level, countries that do not have religious freedom, how can you give them basic human rights, which is some of them, uh, the freedom of religion, how can you give that to them? How exactly are you going to do all these things? Second of all, uh, first of all, talking about the fact that, you, that uh, some workers are exploited uh, and you want illegal migrants to become documented migrants. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> in talking about illegal migrants, they didn't obey the law when they went into that state. How exactly do they deserve more rights? Second of all, the fact that some, uh, some workers are, are, are exploited. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about low-skilled immigrants, and low-skilled immigrants don't know their rights, and this is the problem. It's not a problem the fact that they do not have their rights. In all countries, they have these rights, but the problem is that they don't know about it. And it's not the state's responsibility, the all countries' responsibility, to actually give them these rights. Second of all, uh, the, uh, the fact that migrants boost the GDP. Yes, they boost the GDP according to the economists. Remittances are 20% of a, of a uh, for countries' GDP when they send the money there. Today, not tomorrow when this policy will become will, will become a uh, reality, not when they become a utopia. Today, they're still improving the economy of the country, of host country, of the developing country. They're still doing the same thing. They don't bring any change to the status quo when we're talking about economy. How exactly will just giving some rights improve the economy? How exactly will giving some rights Resolve the problem of aging population taken into consideration that even immigrants age, ladies and gentlemen, if they want to really work in a country. Uh, further on, the fact, uh, the fact that um, we give them only fundamental, uh, fundamental economic rights. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many policies. Yes, it was true that the, what he said in cross examinations, we will bring many policies that already exist. In the uh, ILO Conventions of 1949, they protect immigrants. It was ratified at national level. In the conventions at 1975, they still protect immigrants. And there are local, uh, uh, local policies that still protect immigrants with their rights. They tell them that they have rights. It's not something new. It's not something that we should do to increase this protection because they already have the enough protection that they need. And also, the fact that uh, uh, the second point is that with the point of remittances, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that um, we'll invest more in health and education. How exactly is there a logical link between giving rights, actually giving rights, not protecting the rights, giving the rights, and investing in healthcare and education? First of all. Second of all, the fact that it's already invested in healthcare and education in today's society. They still, um, immigrants still have the right to go to school, still have the right to medical care, even though in some countries this is not respected because the right to live of a human, uh, of a human being is still not respected in some countries. And uh, moving on to uh, the fact that we want to see, the opposition team wants to see how exactly will this work at practical level. And uh, the opposition case today will, is based on two main points. First of all, the fact that it's a not, not an, it's not necessary. Why? First of all, I already told you about the uh, local policies and international conventions that already been accepted and already enforced this, enforce this rights. And second of all, the fact that it's not the state's job because we have another problem today. The problem is that some immigrants do not actually know their rights. Do not actually know that the states give, give you all measures to enforce your rights, to go to the police if you get abused, to go to the police if you're, uh, if you're uh, uh, abused and so on and so forth, exploited. But the fact is that they don't know their rights and it's not the state's job to tell you what your rights are. It's not the state's job to protect your rights that you don't even know about. This is not the state's job. And we want to see how exactly it's all the state's job to do this. Uh, second of all, the fact that it brings negative aspects. They said that we are talking about all countries. How exactly 
with the Middle East, which is uh, has social instability there, how will they actually increase protection of migrants if they don't actually have protection of their own citizens? How exactly will Nepal, which has the, the religion in their constitution, give religious freedom to immigrants when they don't even give religious freedom to their citizens? Because today, ladies and gentlemen, the state's job is to firstly take care of its citizens, and after that, maybe of the immigrants. But first of all, we should, uh, the state should focus on its citizens because it gives a negative message. The message of the state is really important today, ladies and gentlemen, because they, you cannot give the message that we care more of our guests and of our children. And at the, at the end, ladies and gentlemen, because it brings negative message, because it's not necessary, and because the proposition team is not speaking at practical level, we, uh, the motion does not stand. but it doesn't prove your point, the fact that it will make remittances even bigger, it will okay. make the economy even bigger. So basically, worst case scenario, it just stays the same. Remittances continue to help countries export. No, because countries won't be able to implement your policy, all countries. Okay, I'm confused. Uh, can you explain to me again, if we're implementing this treaty, right, how does that stop remittances from being sent back to those countries of origin? Just yeah, it doesn't right. change the status quo at all. Right, okay, and the status quo, according to you, is really good in terms of remittances, right? Remittances are helping these countries of origin. Yeah. Okay, so why is, even if we don't increase remittances at all, how is that a harmful thing? About remittances or, yes, or about, about the whole thing? About, about remittances. Yeah, it doesn't do anything to remittances. Okay, so remittances are saying fantastic, right? Yeah, fantastic. Okay, all the great, way. so this is a great thing coming out of our plan, correct? No. Okay, that's, that looked up a little confusing, but let's move on. So, um, are human rights abuses currently occurring? Yes. Okay. Are they occurring for migrant workers? Yeah. Okay. They're Under so the net, if we if we uh, negate this resolution, do human rights abuses continue to occur? Uh, please repeat the question. If we um, negate the resolution, go with your side. Do the human rights abuses continue to occur? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. If we can prove to you that by affirming we're going to stop these human rights abuses, even in yeah, the we would like way, to see that. We would okay. Like to see that. I, uh, hopefully we can, you know, show you. Um, but if we can show you, um, even in the smallest way, will that be reason to affirm the resolution? Right? Yeah, yeah it would be. Okay, cool. It's gonna be good. Um, so, okay, then my other question is, why does not knowing your rights mean that you shouldn't get them? You get the rights, you just don't know you have them. This, are, this is the problem of low-skilled immigrants. So basically there are migrants walking around with every right in the world, they're just not aware of them. How can you not be aware of your right to, for example, not be abused? Yeah, for example, you don't know the fact that every person knows that he can, he cannot be abused, he shouldn't be abused. Okay, but so not every, every person, let me explain, let me finish. Mm -hmm. Not every person knows that he has the right to go to the police. See? Oh, oh. Ah, okay. Um, so, but, but basically you're saying that there are certain rights that these people know they are entitled to. Yes, there so are. So if they know they're entitled to them, if you know, for example, you're entitled to the right to not be abused, yet you're being abused, doesn't that mean that it's likely that perhaps that right doesn't exist in your country and that it would be a good idea to implement No, that? the problem is you don't know the measure that the states bring forward to you in order to enforce that right. Okay, do you think there's any way that... Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'll <laughs>
Thank you to our opponents for their speech, and thank you to the judges for watching this round. Now, when we're answering today's resolution, there are three key questions that we need to resolve. The first one is, what exactly is the affirmative burden, and what does the status quo look like? Does the plan actually solve for the status quo, and how do the two interact? The second question we need to ask is, if we implement the plan, what types of economic advantages will we see for the country to which the migrants are moving to? So, when the, the host country is essentially what I'm talking about. What benefits can we see there? Then the third and final question we need to answer is, how will the, uh, how will the countries of origin also benefit from the plan, and are there any disadvantages? And if so, how do we weigh between the two? So now let's answer the first question. Remember, during cross-examination, the opposing team already conceded that there are clearly human rights abuses occurring in the status quo. They concede the status quo argument, which is especially important because this highlights the fact that there's a problem that needs to be solved. Their argument is that our plan isn't 100% practical, and we agree. There's no way that we can solve for 100% of rights abuses, but that's not the way plans work. If we can demonstrate that our plan has some sort of net benefit, which they also concede to during cross-examination, then that would necessarily be a reason to affirm today's motion. So remember, the resolution is a question of whether we should give these migrants rights. So if we can demonstrate to you that hypothetically there would be benefits from our plan, then you should affirm. So now let's talk about the plan. Remember that our plan is to increase the basic rights of these people. Remember that it's sufficient to affirm because that is a change from the status quo as we demonstrate in countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, even in the US, there are multiple migrants, there are many migrants who aren't getting fundamental rights that they deserve. So now let's answer the second question, which is how can it help us? Their first argument is that there's no way uh, that, il that illegal immigrants don't deserve rights because they violate the law. However, just because you violate the law doesn't mean that you automatically forfeit all of your rights. Let's say I'm speeding in my car and I break a certain law. That doesn't mean that I forfeit all my rights. I still deserve certain basic rights. The point is that all humans, no matter who they are, deserve certain rights. For example, just because they're an illegal immigrant doesn't mean that the government is allowed to abuse them. Their second argument is that low-skilled immigrants don't know their rights. However, the rights that we're talking about aren't rights that you have to know about. My right to be free from abuse is not a right that I need to be aware of. But secondly, just because I don't know that I have the right to go to police doesn't mean that I shouldn't deserve that right. So even if they aren't fully aware of these rights, doesn't give the government license to just abuse them. So now let's talk about the economic advantages. Their argument is that today there are remittances and we don't see any clear change. However, I'd say that that's empirically false. Today we see that it is the lifeline for many different people. Remember, the World Bank reports that remittances are absolutely necessary for families. But more importantly, this isn't really answering the argument, which is talking more about the host nation. Their next argument is that there are already certain treaties and conventions that are ratified that protect the basic rights. The problem is that this just means that we're protecting rights in name. They concede that in the status quo, these rights aren't actually protected. So the affirmative is the only one that is actually demonstrating to you what is happening in the real world, whereas the negative says, well, we signed some sort of treaty, so the, these rights must be protected. But there's a disconnect between the ratification of these treaties and what's actually happening. So remember, our first argument says that it helps the host nation in two different ways. First of all, migrants are incredibly key to the economy. We give the example of caretakers in the UK. Another example is in the US, uh, illegal immigrants from Mexico tend to take the jobs that US immigrants, uh, that US people don't want to take. So we're giving you multiple examples of how migrants are key to a successful economy. The second argument we give you is that there's going to be fair competition if we make sure that we give them access to economic systems in which they can bargain, which improves the working conditions of everybody in the host nation. So remember, they say that if we can show you some sort of benefit for the host nation, you would affirm. But now let's answer the second, uh, the third question, which is what are the benefits for the nations uh, that are the, the migrants are leaving? So go to the remittances argument. They say that there's no clear link between giving rights and giving education. However, this is simply false. For example, in the U.S., only five to ten percent of uh, illegal immigrants get access to secondary education because they are denied that right. This education is absolutely necessary for them to access any sort of higher level of education for them to access real jobs. So you can extend where I told you the economist. Uh, the Economist does a study showing that freer migration and giving them these rights could actually double the global GDP, which helps everyone at the end of the day. Then the next argument they make is that today they already have these rights, but remember, they concede themselves during status quo that they don't have these rights. So let's go to their case. Now, I've already hit upon the major point in their case. Their first major argument is that it's unnecessary, but by conceding the status quo arguments, we are demonstrating that it's absolutely necessary that we do something. Their next argument is that there's going to be some sort of conflict of rights. But remember, they never clearly explain to you how giving rights to migrants will necessarily take away the rights of national citizens. In fact, the contentions in the affirmative plan clearly show you that the interests are not contrary, but are rather the same. And that when we help migrants, we also help ourselves, and we give you multiple examples of the 
the real world. So the firm clearly demonstrates that this would be a good motion, both for the, uh, the host nation and the nation of origin. That's the result. What is your job as affirmative? Ah, uh, our job as affirmative is to show that the motion is a good idea, right? Yeah. So, so do you want to give rights or just to increase protection? Well, two are kind of the same, right? The motion is increase protection of rights. But you so, give them rights. So, for example, workers that are not getting the right to liberty, right, we would be giving them that right. My argument is that they okay, are thank entitled you, thank to thank you very much. Right. Yeah, sure. Well, let's, let's look at what's happening today. We have some policies, some of papers that you're talking about, the fact that they're only signed their own papers. Yeah. Are you bringing forward a new paper? Okay, the motion is not necessarily talking about a specific convention, right? That's the other motion. This motion is talking about actually in the real world what governments should be doing. This motion says... What should governments be doing? They should be increasing the protection of How? social and economic rights. How? Okay, so that's the plan, right? The plan says that we need to improve basic working conditions as well as give them access to certain fundamental rights, such as education. The problem is that that isn't happening in the status quo, so the firm plan is a shift from the status quo. Can you tell me the difference between not knowing a right and not having a right? Okay, let's say uh, I don't know that I have the right to be free from abuse, right? That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have that right. Just because I don't know I shouldn't be abused doesn't mean that you get to walk up to me and no, kill me, so right? For so example, not knowing a right I understand. For example, a per every person here has a human right, right? The all human rights. I should hope so, yeah. Yeah, so if a person doesn't know one human right in that whole convention, <coughs> does that mean that he doesn't have it? Uh, I think the problem is that I don't really understand what you mean by they don't know they have their rights, right? Like, I should have the right to liberty. I'm pretty sure people generally don't want to be abused, right? I think I'm just, I think we're just unclear about what do you mean by they don't know their rights. The rights the affirmative is talking about are rights that people are entitled to okay, by nature. Okay. So, if are illegal immigrants human beings? Uh, yes. So they, so they have human yes. rights. Uh, they should have human rights, but those rights aren't protected in the status quo. But they have them even though they are not protected, right? I don't understand what it means to have a right without being protected, right? If I have the right to life but someone kills me, I don't actually have that right. It's gone, right? So these rights need to be protected. If they're not protecting, the government abuses these people. They're not enjoying their rights. Okay, you're ignoring the problem. You're good to explain. Sorry. Um, why is someone denied the right to education? Why? I mean, possibly because the government doesn't want to give it to them. They don't have access to it. Uh, they're too poor to Can they school. report the fact that they don't have the rights to education? No, because, for example, in the U.S., if you're an illegal immigrant, you don't get So you want education. to make illegal immigrants legal immigrants? No. Do they steal the jobs? No. Of no. My argument... First of all, nowhere is it demonstrated that they steal jobs of Americans. In fact, the firm proves that the two coexist well, right? They are mutually beneficial. Second of all, my argument is that they should have access to basic rights, right? So we're not giving them tons of privileges, but rather they should have access to basic rights, basic education. Thank you very much. Not that they are not. Thank you.
a little things that have happened here. Well, actually, first and foremost, we want to prove you that the proposition team did not prove the motion. Why? Because they want to give rights to migrants. They, do, they have to increase the protection, but they did not explain us. They didn't give us even a definition to explain us how they want to increase it, this protection. They want to give rights. But today, we have ex explained you that they already have this right. And we have explained you that if they have this right, then we should not do anything uh, more than that. Moreover, but even if they would have proven the motion, let's get into their case. Well, actually, the first thing that we have proved you and the first thing that, 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 the, that the first opposition speaker has told you is the fact that we live in reality and that they give on utopia. Well, actually, we're talking about the feasibility of their plan, which doesn't exist at the moment. It is a good idea. And if I quote a word from the second speaker, they told us if they work hypothetically. Well, actually, we do not want anything hypothetically into this debate. We want things practically. And this is why I'm going, that's what I'm going to talk about in my speech. Furthermore, I'm going to talk about a little bit the difference between to know a right and to have a right. Well, actually, if, um, if they, they already have this right, and this is exactly what we are proving, they have the right from conventions. From this convention that we already have given you an example, 1949, 1975, and even the convention of 1990 that we have already debated, uh, we're saying that these, are always, these rights are already given, and these rights are currently being given, and we're saying that they are not bring, bringing us anything more uh, forward. Moreover, we're saying that there are a lot of migrants that do not know their rights and did not understand. Well, actually, let, let, let me give you an example of what means not to know a right. Well, actually, when you're abused, when you're abused at your own home, well, if you do not, you do not know exactly what's the role of that country, you do not know exactly that you can go to a judge and tell me, well, this is abusing me because I'm actually afraid that somebody is going, uh, that somebody is going to cut off of my wage. And this is exactly what we're saying. They do not know their rights. And if they give them more rights, they will not know it either way and we're saying that they already have this right moreover let's talk about the fact that they have told us that it's going to be a successful economy ladies and gentlemen they, oh, this, the economy is already successful on that point it didn't show us at any point how the economy is going to be more increased if they give more protection so this uh, this logical bond wasn't even explained moreover let's talk about practicality and we have told you that these things cannot be done and why they cannot be done because it is not possible for all states because they want all states to do that and let's talk about these states that they can't do that it's that freedom of religion we have brought you the example of countries that ha that do not have freedom of religion we have brought you the example of countries that do not have the human rights enforced how can you increase protection in this in this direction how can, can you give more rights to migrants when you not when not even the citizens have rights and this is exactly what we have proved that this plan is not feasible because they didn't explain us in any way what right they give, how they give, and how it's going to be a great benefit from it. Just it's going to happen. But no, we're, today we're saying that this is not going to happen. Moreover, let's, um, they, they, ha they have told us that this convention only protect their name and that today they're actually doing something, but this is exactly what, we're the, what they are doing too. They're also protecting the name. They also protect the name that we're giving protection to everyone and things could be pink, but they're not going to be pink. And this is what we have shown you. Moreover, um, let's talk about the fact, they have told, oh, okay, let's pass to the illegal migrants. Huh. The illegal migrants have no responsibility. Illegal migrants get into that country. They bro break the law when they get into that country. And because of the fact that they break the law, they do not deserve anything. And it's exactly what we're saying. If they want rights, then they should become legal. They should take this, this risk, become legal, pay taxes. That's their, that's exactly their opinion. Actually, we do not care of illegal migrants. And we're saying that if they're illegal, let them be illegal. We do not want to give them any right or any protection. Because as I said, they already break the law. Huh, Marv. Let's talk, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the opposition case. We have told you exactly that this is not necessary. And why? Because the, the immigrants do not know their rights. And because of the fact that it's not the state job. And why it's not the state job? Because it's, a, it's the job of a migrant. It's the job of a migrant when he gets from one country to another, he knows that he's, a, he's in a different country. And because of the fact that he knows that he's in a different country, he knows that laws are different. 
and because of, and knowing the laws are different makes him aware of the fact that things could be different. And this is what we're saying we should not, we, we cannot increase that because it's not a state job. Now let's pass on to these negative aspects. We have told you exactly that a state should take care of the citizens, but they have told told us that we did that we didn't show us that that we didn't show them. Actually we're saying that the message of the state is wrong in this in this very moment because when they're when they're saying that they they giving rights to migrants, well actually we're talking about citizens that also have problems and the fountains that often occur in countries. And at the end of the day, because of the fact that I'm explaining that this practicality doesn't exist in their case, that their case is not feasible in any any way, then please oppose. your speech, I have questions. Okay. So would you agree that people should help others? Right? Sure. Okay. So let's put you in a situation where there's someone right, you know, they're drowning, right? But you're like tied up and you can't help them. Does yes. that mean you shouldn't help them? I'm trying, but I can't actually. I right. can't but does that mean that you shouldn't help them? They don't really deserve to get help because you're sort of tied up. Uh, well, actually, if they got into if they got into that lake, maybe it's their fault. Maybe they shouldn't okay. have gone okay. there. Okay. Yeah. So it's their fault. To swim. It's their fault. So they don't deserve anything because it's their fault. So you shouldn't help them, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes, okay. it's their fault. Okay, so only if it's their fault. What if it isn't their fault? What if someone pushed them? Oh, okay. If you're talking about legal migrants, because that's what I no, no, I'm not talking about. Oh, no? I'm not talking okay. about legal migrants. I'm just talking about the word should. Oh, okay. Say someone pushes them. <laughs> should you help them or should you not? You're tied up. You can't help them. I can't help them, so I'm not discussing if I can help him or not. Uh, if, I, if I want to help him or not. Right, I but I'm saying can't. morally, like in your own mind, should you try to help them? Should you? If it's his fault, I'm not going All to right, help okay. him. So anyway. it's his fault. All right, okay, so we're talking about his fault. I have another law. Say you break the law, right? Say you're driving sort of fast. And that police pulls you over and he goes, hey, you broke the law. Give me your license. Does that mean that you forfeit all of your rights? Because you did break the law. Yes, I broke the law, so right. it's my fault. Right, so you forfeit all your rights, right? Fulfill all my rights? Like all of your rights. Like you don't deserve anything because you broke the law. Right? No, I actually do not deserve the right to drive anymore. But because you said that illegal idea. immigrants don't deserve anything because they broke the law. Yeah, they yeah they break the law. They right. get into so the, you the law. It's different than you went driving. too fast, and you, how is it different? You broke the law. Actually, we're saying the fact that when you get into the country, you have the responsibility of getting into okay. that country. When and you, if you get into that country car, illegally, right? then when you get into that yeah. country, yeah, all yeah, your that, that. Oh, but right. when you drive a car, do you not have the responsibility to drive at a same like speed? Or should you drive fast? Like, can you drive fast? Is that like acceptable? And then you don't forfeit any of your rights? Or should you give up everything because you broke the law? Well, actually, it, I think the law is perfectly fine when it's saying to me okay. that I shouldn't drive anymore for pretty, like, three months. It's okay. Okay, but then you also take away everything else, right? Like, do you deserve to live after you just broke the law? You just drove too fast. Do you deserve to live? Yeah, yeah I deserve to live, to live, but I do not why deserve to be in that country anymore. I do not deserve to drive anymore. But you broke the law. Why should you deserve to live? Sir. <laughs> we did not say that we're not mind. We're no, not I'm just asking you in this situation. You just drove too fast. Okay. You broke the law. Why do you deserve to live? I deserve to live, but because that's my human right. Okay, so there are intrinsic rights that all people should have, regardless. Yeah, of the they laws should have, but sometimes right. they do not. Right. Right. Sounds good. Now I have a last question. Eh, I might be a little convoluted, but, <laughs> but basically, what are some? Say everyone has a right to not be robbed, right? Yes. Like okay. So what are some ways some uh, government can protect? That? How do you protect that right? Just give me like an example. Well, when you put a law into action, and you put sanctions, if somebody All right, so say you have a law in action, you can't get robbed. There are no police force. There's no police force. Like, can you, is that still a right? Well, actually, is if it I- being protected? Uh, sir, if I did not know that I can get to the police, then no. So it's not being protected if you don't know. Thank you.
first off, the first point I'm going to bring up is what is the affirmative burden, what's going on in the status quo, and how does the affirmative solve the problems in the status quo, or at least create some significant change within those problems. Then I'm going to talk to you about what the benefits of our plan are for the host country. Third, I'm going to talk about what the benefits of our plan are for the country of origin. And fourth, I'm going to talk to you about the fact that immigration occurs regardless of whether we affirm or negate, and that doing our plan will actually help these immigrants, help the nation of the uh, country, the host country and the country of origin, essentially a big picture. Uh, and then last, we're going to talk about just in basic terms why she, uh, this argument about citizens and migrants in these countries that don't have rights for both. So let's start off with what the affirmative burden is. So they essentially can concede the status quo. We've been saying this since the second speech and it really hasn't been addressed, right? They can see that human rights abuses are currently going on. They, can, they don't give us any way to solve these human rights abuses, so as long as we show you that there's going to be some significant change in making events, uh, making these human rights abuses stop occurring in some small way, this is reason to affirm. However, in my speech later on, I'm going to go on and tell you that there's a bit of a larger benefit here. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, she tells us that uh, this issue of illegal immigrants, right? She says that because they broke the law once entering this country, they deserve to be essentially abused for the rest of their life. Okay, she says they have no rights. That includes right to life, right to, you know, uh, protection from abuse, etc., etc. Now, in cross-examination, she conceded that this is essentially a terrifying situation when she herself was put in this position and we talked to her about speeding in a car and she essentially said that she did not want to die have, for having speeded, speeded in a car. Okay, sped in a car. <laughs> So um, essentially, this is one reason why these illegals need these rights. It's just the moral thing to do, and I'll talk about this later. Um, secondly, she talks about this issue of people knowing their rights versus being given their rights. So um, most rights, there are several rights that are known, as she conceded in the process, right? She knows she has the right to live. Why? Because she said she is a human, and this is a human right. So there are rights that are known. Secondly, let's talk about the fact that not knowing that you have a right doesn't mean that you shouldn't be given rights, right? So they can see it in process that just giving people these rights means protecting their rights, therefore affirming the situation. So the, the uh, resolution. So even if we weren't to show you, we weren't to show you that anybody are going to know about these rights, at least we know that these rights are being given, therefore we're affirming. Secondly, some people will actually find out about these rights, right? We're giving rights. They're not secret rights. Theoretically, someone's going to find out about them. And then the last argument is just even if no one knows about these rights, even if they're, you know, senseless people who, you know, for whatever reason have no way of finding anything out around them, it's still the government's moral obligation to ensure that they have these basic human rights. So now let's talk about um, essentially this should argument, right? So we talked about how should implies what we, what we should do. Should I do my homework? Yes, I should do my homework. How am I going to do it? That's not exactly the question. However, even if you don't agree with this, we do show you how we're going to implement our plan, and we do show you these real world benefits, not benefits in heaven, benefits in real world that uh, are coming out of this plan. So uh, the first benefit is uh, for the host country. So the past two speakers have talked about how uh, the rights aren't currently being protected, right? And they talked about how these economies are already fine. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to benefit the host country. This is their only argument against the fact that we talk about our plan helping the host country. The economies in all countries are not perfect. We wouldn't be standing here debating this resolution if that were the case, right? So as they said, this is in heaven. So we know for a fact that we have, if, and if we can benefit the economy at all, that's a good thing. And we show you with our caretakers example in the UK and our example of everything that the immigrants in the United States are giving back to the economy, that we are helping the economy of the host country. Secondly, we talk about the country of origin. We talk about remittances, which they themselves agree are great things. Now, firming this resolution will increase remittances because these people will have better rights, which will lead them to get better jobs, which are higher paying jobs, which will allow them to make more money, which will allow them to send home bigger remittances, right? So the a benefit that we're getting in the status quo of these remittances is just being increased exponentially. Now let's talk about the fact that um, the GDP is going to double internationally, according to The Economist, if we uh, give these rights. So we're helping the country origin, we're helping the host country. So lastly, she talks about these countries where citizens and non-citizens both don't have rights. Do I think citizens should have these basic rights? Absolutely. Do I think migrants should have these rights? Absolutely. The resolution is whether or not we should give migrants these rights, and I believe we should. So for all these reasons, because you can see there are many benefits coming out of the affirmative that aren't coming out of the negative, I would urge you to negate the resolution. Affirm, affirm the resolution. <laughs> Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have here a very interesting debate because the proposition team is thinking about discussing everything practically and how more rights equals better. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, on a hypothetical level, more rights equals something better because rights are universally better. But on a practical level, the opposition team has proven to you, us today, that these rights neither do not bring anything better, that these rights can neither be implemented and the, that these rights in practical are worse than better. Now, I'm going to talk to you about on theoretical level and on practical level what is happening and about the most and biggest clash area and where the discussion remain about illegal migrants. And let's start with these illegal migrants. In the first cross-examination, their first proposition, they were told us that we are referring to illegal immigrants. Ladies and gentlemen, let's present some of the facts in the status quo that we have been repeating. You have no way of knowing how many migrants work, how many illegal migrants are. You have no way of giving them more rights as long as they don't respect you. And this is not the job, the state's job, to enforce more rights on you if you do not want to get them. Because if you would have wanted to get them, you would have become legal. Now, they didn't obey the law, as we have stated in all three speeches. And when you do not take some responsibilities, ladies and gentlemen, because you receive rights when you take some responsibilities and when they didn't take the responsibility of following the law, they shouldn't receive the right of protection, ladies and gentlemen, because the state basically has no duty towards these migrants because the migrants did not do what the state asked for them, asked from them. <coughs> now, they have human rights, ladies and gentlemen. And on a hypothetical level, these human rights should be perfectly implemented in all states of the world. Yet we still have problems, and because of their hypothetical vision, they actually admitted that we still have problems. On the hypothetical level, these increasing of protection, whatever it may mean, will bring so much benefit, so many utopia that the world is going to go pink all of a sudden. What? And now the last point of this uh, clash area: What does the state do? It respects the person that respects itself as a human being, because this is the fundamental. If you do not respect the state and Continuing it, the law, you cannot, the state does not have the right to respect you and does not have any duty in doing that. Now, let's talk on a theoretical level. We have a new paper, ladies and gentlemen, of increasing the right, the motion. That's the new theoretical paper that the proposition team wants to bring us today. Now, let's look at something more theoretical. The human rights, ladies and gentlemen. Human rights are on a theoretical level, are principally correct, and we all know them theoretically. We all have them theoretically. We are all insured to them, theoretically, but yet we have problems, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what they bring today. Even though on a theoretical basis, utopia is going to happen on a practical level, we won't have that. Now, rights are given. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, hypothetically, they are given. They should be respected. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, yet we have problems. Why is that? Because in theory, that does not work. They said that more rights are going to be given because somewhere in the middle it remained. But hypothetically, it's going to be better. But giving them rights and does not equal protection, ladies and gentlemen, because by giving rights, we do not better protect any right. By giving them rights, we do not better increase nor the protection for economic and social rights. Now, on a practical level and why it cannot be implemented, the plan of the opposition. Now, the freedom of religion, as they have stated in their definitions, because they even they fail to bring us a definition of increasing rights. The freedom of religion and social instability. You cannot implement these things because in a state, the state has a duty towards its citizens, ladies and gentlemen, firstly and foremost. Why? Because the citizens respect the state. Now, hypothetically, human rights should be enforced, yet they are not. On a practical level, these rights won't even be enforced because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't even know what these rights are. We don't even know what these rights are supposed to do. We don't even know where these rights are supposed to be given except for in the case of illegal migrants in which I have already explained to you that the state does not want to act there. Now, the, the, on a uh, hypothetical level as I have stated, everybody knows their rights. 
Yet, ladies and gentlemen, we have more and more problems because low-skilled migrants do not know these rights, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the main problem today. If they were to know these rights, things will be done, and less and less human rights abuses would be done. Now, about the message of the state that it sends on a practical level. The message of the state practically shows that we take more care about the migrants than about our people, ladies and gentlemen, and this is not something we want because this will bring even more social instability, which we want to avoid. And now, in the end, on a hypothetical level, we need more protection, even though we do not know what that is in the Proposition 15 case. And what we have on a practical level, nothing, ladies and gentlemen.